We will talk on conducting research in India as a foreign China scholar. And uh, just now, uh, Professor Alka told that uh, she put it in capital. So that is most important, that foreign. Uh, so, mm, uh, and uh, um, she will, today she will talk on general, uh, she will give some general idea about her research. And uh, she is presently a PhD scholar in uh, North Carolina University, Chapel Hill in the US. And uh, her research topic is political belonging of East Turkestanis of League Uyghurs in homeland and diaspora. And the period she has taken is uh, 1930 to 1970. And uh, for that, she worked here in India last summer. So are you back? I'm in Turkey. OK, um, you are now in the US. Yeah. No, I'm in Turkey. You are Turkey. now in the USA or in Delhi? In, okay. in Ankara, okay. in Turkey. OK, OK, you are in Turkey. Yeah. OK, so oh, yes, I saw your surname, and I found that it is a um, Turkish surname. So you are basically from Turkey. So, no, my husband is, but. Oh, OK, your husband is Turkish. OK, so um, OK, OK, nice to know you. So now we will, uh, so today she will cover uh, what national archives of India can offer and, and how we can tap these resources for uh, our research in, uh, on Xi Uyghur and Xinjiang. And uh, of course, uh, she will also cover uh, state of the field in Xinjiang and Uyghur studies, and uh, what are the common sources we are using. And as far as the resources is concerned, we are uh, always uh, in a resource crunch is always there. Not I'm talking about in terms of financial resource crunch as far as uh, research material wise. So, uh, so sometimes we use common research uh, areas. And I think after uh, studying for a long time, I find it really problematic to especially the area I am working, contemporary period. So, uh, so this is a, uh, but today she will talk about the resources and what kind of st study is going on. So across, uh, across the world. So in China also, will you cover China also? Um, yes, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so he, as a foreign, she possibly thinks that as a foreign China scholar working in India, she has something to say that what is her experience. And we hear Indian scholars on China, working on China, and we know what kind of difficulties we face in China. So, um, so with this, uh, I would like to invite Arian, and uh, please go ahead. All right, I will try to um, start my slideshow. Let's see if I can share the screen. One second. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, it's visible, but uh, I would suggest to play the PPT because it's not on full screen. Okay. My apologies, I'll just pause sharing. Um, uh, okay. Or uh, if you want, then uh, you could share the PPT over mail so that I could uh, play the PPT from this side. Okay. Um, uh, 
Um, good afternoon, uh, ma'am. While you are uh, making, you know, fixing your screen, would, uh, can I introduce the uh, the seminar and also the housekeeping rules? Is that fine with you? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Yukti Pawar, and I'm a research intern in Institute of Chinese Studies. So, like uh, Professor um, Devashish Chaudhary has uh, introduced our speaker and the topic of today. Um, he is all also our chair today, and um, Ms. Ariane uh, will be talking about how her experience has been to research about China in different areas around the world, which is different from her homeland. And while, before mom goes ahead, there are some housekeeping rules. Please do not turn on your speakers uh, while the speaker is uh, presenting. So basically, you, are, you have to stay muted while the presentation is going on, and you cannot interrupt the speakers. And for, for, during the question hour, uh, we will be taking the questions via chat and you will be allowed to raise your hand on Zoom. Only when the chair selects the person to speak up, then they can, you can propose your questions. Uh, like mentioned before, you can also pose your questions in the chat box and accordingly the question and answers will be taken care of. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, if everybody can hear me, then I will start. So yeah. um, should I start? Yeah, yeah, ma'am, please. Okay, so as I've been introduced, my name is Ariane Akinji. I'm actually from Minnesota in the U.S. originally, and I am currently researching and writing a dissertation on the political belonging of East Turkestani, today commonly known as the Uyghurs, in homeland, which would be Xinjiang or East Turkestan in what is now Northwest China, and diaspora during the transition from imperial to nation state system, from about 1930 to 1970. So first I'd like to give you a little bit of background and kind of why I wanted to talk about doing research in India as a foreign to India scholar of China. Um, so I majored in both history and Chinese in college. I went to Reed College in the United States, which is a very good Chinese program, but it's also very China centered as a lot of Chinese studies programs are. Um, Right. I wrote a thesis on underground literature in the Cultural Revo Revolution between 1966-1976 in China, and I started graduate school in an East Asian Studies program. I also wrote my master's thesis in 2019 on the gendered incorporation of Uyghur women in the People's Republic of China in the 1950s and 60s. So I spent several years during and after university living in China. And for many, many years, I considered myself a historian of China. Let me see if I can. Okay. So when I came to write my dissertation, I knew that I wanted to explore the origins of the situation in Xinjiang. So I started writing my dissertation in 2019 when things had already very much gotten quite bad. Um, and this meant dipping into the pre-People's Republic of China or pre-PRC period. When I wrote up grant applications and started doing research, I was still conceptualizing my topic as residing within China studies, which is fairly common among scholars, especially in the US, I think US, Europe, and Australia. We tend to think of China studies as happening in China, and especially if you are in China or like in Beijing or in Guangzhou, people talk about China studies as encapsulated by the contemporary borders of the People's Republic of China. So conceptualizing my topic that way, when I started research, um, actually when I started research on my master's thesis in 2017, which of course everyone knows is when it was really no longer possible for scholars to do research in Xinjiang. And it stopped being possible for scholars, especially from the US, to do research in China around the same period. Right. Um, so I know from personal experience that Chinese studies can be quite insular with many scholars focusing on their topic just from within a purely China, China kind of parameters. When I was in China, it seemed like there was a competition among foreigners to be seen by Chinese as like Zhongbo Shuo or like a China expert who understood China from the inside out, which is an act that requires internalizing this notion that China is really central to the framing of any discourse, hence the China, China, China. Um, So I want to talk a little bit about the limitations of doing research within 
with just regional sources. So I last lived in China, actually in Urumqi in Xinjiang in 2013, um, which is the year before the internment camps were set up, although there were already a number of security measures when I was there. So by the time I started thinking about my dissertation in 2019, it was impossible to get to the region as a scholar. And even if the government did give visas to researchers, which it doesn't, um, and research permits, I wouldn't be able to access anything worthwhile in the archives. And if I did go to the region, my presence would immediately cast suspicion on and could endanger my context. Even in 2013, we had issues where some of my students or some of my friends did get interrogated by the police concerning their relationship with me, even though I was officially in the region as a teacher at a state university. So this is definitely not something I would want to repeat now because I know um, I'm fairly immune because of my passport, but my interlocutors are not. So that's not something I think is very ethical right now. So for my master's thesis, I primarily used official publications, including both popular press, like the People's Daily, and items published by the government and available online through electronic databases, luckily available through my university. There is a wealth of information in these materials, but they can also somewhat limit the perspective that they offer. China scholars have traditionally also looked at the Republic of China archives in Taipei and elsewhere in Taiwan. However, resources on Xinjiang are somewhat limited as somehow that specific office burned down in the 1980s after inquiries concerning misappropriated funds were made following a request for a $100,000 luxury vehicle for the office director. So oh, they don't exist anymore. Um, Xinjiang scholar Justin Jacobs has reconstructed many of the files from this office through an exhaustive search for correspondence between the Xinjiang Bureau and other offices. And while Jacobs has found an impressive amount of material, this is too somewhat limited in its perspective because it's really about how the Republic of China, the Taiwanese government was seeing the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So, and yet the majority of scholarship on Uyghurs and on Xinjiang relies on sources that are produced inside the region. Oops. Oh my goodness, sorry. Okay. Okay. So these primarily include Chinese sources and a smattering of Turkey sources. When people can get their hands on them, Ryan Thumb, perhaps most famously, assembled a canon of pre 20th century literature by frequenting secondhand bazaars, bookshops, and shrine, shrine festivals around Kashgar, something that is sadly no longer possible. Recently, several scholars, most prominently David Brophy, have used Russian language sources in Kazakhstan, though of course, because of political situations and geopolitical relations, this is kind of touch and go or hit and miss, depending on whether or not people can actually get access to those resources. Additionally, many scholars will kind of round off their research by looking at holdings at Kew or looking at collections of Europeans who once lived in the region about 100 years ago or traveled through the region. However, again, the majority of the material has been produced in or about this specific politically delineated region. Okay, here, I would argue that relying on yeah, regionally centered material results in skewered scholarship. Working from this material induces scholars to create narratives that reinforce Xinjiang as a self-contained space with impermeable borders. And working with material produced by or in relation to the Chinese government archives also reinforces the importance of state actors and institutions. Tibet is actually a parallel example. Um, Swati Chawla, who I think was also with ICS when she was doing her dissertation research several years ago, looked at this as well. Um, if you rely on Chinese language scholarship, one would come to the conclusion that Tibet was part of the Republic of China prior to 1959 and the People's Republic of China prior to 1959. But a closer look at these sources and incorporation of comparative cross-border sources on Tibet during that period would show that the only Chinese government officials present in the vast region for about 50 years were a radio operator and their assistant. And then on the ground, reality differed quite substantially from that on the books. Oops. Okay. Um, so 
Is Uyghur study, is China study, is it Xinjiang study? Um, I would say that Uyghur and Xinjiang studies shouldn't be confined to Xinjiang or to China, the way it is, has been traditionally conceived. People, economies, ideas, and politics, societies, and cultures don't always heed state borders. The same Justin Jacobs article I referred to above noted that a number of Uyghurs ended up in Turkey around 1952 to 1954. In 2019, one of my mentors suggested that I look there to at least get another perspective, especially given the restrictions on access to material in China. But there was something else. The more that I looked at material in Turkey, the more that I realized, as Linda Benson, who is a kind of an early Xinjiang scholar, found uh, concerning the mid-19th century, people, politics, economic networks were hardly contained by contemporary borders. Even before people migrated to Turkey, there were connections with, reg um, with bordering regions throughout the 19th and 20th, first half of the 20th century. So in the first half of the 20th century, East Turkestani or Uyghurs were an incredibly cross-border people. So it really doesn't make sense to look at Uyghurs just within today's borders, um, including Xinjiang. So, however, from some reason, very few people have thought to look in India, including at the National Archives of India. And we end up with these jumps of scholarship based in Xinjiang to scholarship based in Turkey. So what I am looking at right now is East Turkestanis who formed basically their own state or attempted to form their own state in 1930. And then when the Soviets and Chinese and like Muslim Chinese warlords ganged up against them. They fled to first to India, from India to Afghanistan, eventually made their way back to China and reattempted to establish a Turkish national state within kind of under the umbrella of the Republic of China. And of course, when the People's Liberation Army marched on Xinjiang and the People's Republic of China was formed in 1949, a number of these people, about 700, again, fled over the border to India, where they attempted to seek refuge. And in 1950, between 1952 and 1954, they moved on to Turkey. So, however, with the exception of several articles um, by Ishtikus Jubanathan, who's a specialist in Kazakh studies at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, the studies of the Eastern Hispanic diaspora in Turkey have been undertaken from a Uyghur nationalist perspective. They're largely based off the writings of a few key activists and their progeny, and they project a history of the community that supports the goals and political stance of contemporary Uyghur organizations in diaspora. India and the time that people spend in India and other places in Central Asia is often omitted from the story altogether. So the East Turkestani, as in the photo here, spent several years in India. And for much of this time, they wanted to stay in India and they tried to integrate into the local community in Kashmir. There was also a very extensive trade network related to or originally from East Turkestan that was located in Kashmir and many of those people did not move on in the 1950s. However, the entire East Turkestani presence or Uyghur presence in India is usually covered in just a few sentences. And it's just kind of like they were on a train and they passed through India on their way to Turkey. Um, so I was really wondering about this part of the story, which is how I ended up in India on the Fulbright this past summer. So I went to India to chase down this part of the narrative because everyone referred to it, but no one actually had looked at it. What I found, though, was not just that story, but also a lot of literature that pertained to the other parts of my dissertation as well. Okay. So as many of you probably know, and as I wish a lot of scholars who are based in the US or in Europe or everywhere apart from India would also know is that there is a lot of literature in India, particularly at the National Archives India that is on China. Um, there is material on the Republic of China, including the two capitals of Nanjing and Chongqing, and to an extent on Shanghai, um, Madhavi Tampi, who's here right now, 
has written a really great gorgeous materials related to the Republic era of China in the National Archives of India. There's also a decent, a very good amount of material on Xinjiang, usually spelled Xinjiang, Tibet, and other border areas, including Yunnan. Um, I did not get to look at the Yunnan stuff as much or stuff on Gansu, but I know that it is there from coming across it in the archives. And a lot of it, <laughs> a lot of it provides really rich material that we aren't seeing in the Chinese archives. They could be used as a great complement to material that is being used by China scholars. Um, there's also a lot of material on people from Xinjiang, also called East Turkestan, often called East Turkestan, Kashgari, or Chinese Turkestan, and their extensive activities in India and Afghanistan. And this includes people who are coming as traders, as pilgrims, as refugees, oftentimes traders, pilgrims, and refugees all at the same time and in the same party. Um, and there's also a lot of literature that pertains to other fields like pan-Islam, pan inter-Asian connections, and everything from Arab adventurers who are fighting with the East Turkestani and then selling their services to Japan and Japanese interests in Central Asia and Central Asia Muslims within the greater East Asian co-prosperity spirit, um, co-prosperity spirit before World War II. Okay. And I'd just like to take a moment to highlight the, some of the academics who have been doing some of this work, looking at um, Xinjiang India connections and using, um, using the Indian archives to actually look at history in China. So of course we have Madhavi Pampi, who's here today, um, Antara Datta, who's at Royal Holloway in the UK. I think she's giving a talk in, tomorrow. Um, and then as I mentioned before, Ishik Pushju Bonavant, who's at the Middle East Technical University in Turkey. Um, Antara Data focuses mostly on non-partition refugees. So she's ended up touching on the Kazakhs and Uyghurs. And then Ishik uh, mostly studies Kazakhs in Turkey. Um, and then I've been working with her to show her some of the material that we have in India as well. All right. Um, so I wanna highlight a little bit what we can gain from the archives. The first one is a sense of networks that did not end at the border. When you start looking at the archives in India, it's very obvious, sorry, there's a mosquito here, um, that there are these really extensive trade networks, pilgrim networks, um, political networks. And a lot of times these people are taking on all three identities at the same time. So you have political refugees who are loading up their caravans with carpets, with namdas, with silks to sell in India, and they are crossing the borders as traders. And then they are using the profits from trade to go on pilgrimage to Hajj, where they kind of wait out the crisis before returning to their homeland. So people are taking on all of these different disguises or all of these different identities. And you find that a lot of the same individuals coming up again and again and again. And a lot of them are related to each other. So there's these very extensive networks that cross both Xinjiang, Kashmir, um, and Afghanistan, also the Punjab. Um, so we also get this sense of cross-border and multiple identities. The archives in India have material that fills in many of the gaps in stories where other historians are just kind of provided an ellipsis. Like, we think this happened. People went over there. Five years later, they came back. Um, but it's, of course, it's much richer than that. And of course, it casts some of the key characters in different lights. So we get these Turkic nationalists that look very different when they are in India and they're saying very different things. And we get a much more well-rounded understanding of their intentions, of their personality, of the political battles that they were fighting and the resources that they had to draw. This also helps to um, explain some of the complexities of politics and identities in the region today. Because um, of course, today, the Chinese government is trying to make the Uyghurs take on a single unified identity that really places them within, squarely within the Chinese nation. And when we're reading through these archives, we get the sense that this entirely was not the case. Um, people had many layers to their identity. They were much more embedded in regional politics, in cross-border networks. Um, and this, I think, uh, exemplifies the highly contentious nature of Chinese claims and the tenuous nature of Chinese control on the region through the 1950s. So I would just like to end, I know this is a fairly short talk, um, that I hope that more people will start using the Indian archives 
in doing research on China. And I hope that we can start to use these archives to write fuller history. Um, the Indian archives are not perfect, neither are the Chinese archives or the archives that might be in the UK, but each set of archival materials will help us, will give us a new perspective and help us to create a more complete picture of the people and of the region that we are working on. So I'd like to end this talk with a call for other academics to also use the Indian archives to do research on Xinjiang and on the Uyghurs. Um, so my own research starts only in the 1930s, but I do know from looking through the archives, there is a wealth of information on earlier period, periods and on other topics that I cannot cover in my dissertation. So I am done. Um, nice to hear, Arian, about your research interest. You started your, you talked about your academic uh, academic journey mm -hmm. and as a China scholar and then underground literature during cultural revolution and Uyghur was your another interest area and then when you and the difficulties you faced during your first uh, that was that your first visit 2013 uh, um, no I had lived in China on and off since 2008. Okay. 2008, um, okay, eight on you stayed there first. Yeah. Several times you visited Xinjiang. Okay, unfortunately yeah. I visited twice only. So yeah, she covered all these areas and then she difficulties and what kind of difficulties she was facing. And, and then she, uh, you explored, she explored Taiwan uh, archival material as well, uh, which are not, still not, explored fully and then uh, so this uh, research and then she talked about uh, general um, study as far as Xinjiang is concerned so and what are kind of resources are, are being used by China Xinjiang scholars Xinjiang Xinjiang scholar they are also she has something to say that uh, whether Xinjiang scholarship, is a China scholarship or it is beyond that. In fact, uh, um, uh, I wrote a paper on Xinjiang studies and its relevance in India. And mm -hmm. uh, it was written five to three, five years back, I think. At 2020, it was published in Himalayan and Central Asian studies. And there I, since I am not uh, basically I started with the history, of course, but then I shifted uh, the way um, you are from your contemporary period, you are shifting to the archival material that is the sources you are using. So from history, I started. So that on the basis of those studies, when I wrote this paper, I covered this uh, explorer and traders and Tun Huang studies some of Indian scholars who work on those areas, Tha Professor Than, Professor, Professor Than Chu, uh, who was basically from India, uh, is an Indian scholar. So uh, he wrote a book on Tun Huang study. And then there are other scholars also work on historical period and then colonial period, you know, Professor Dr. Thampi uh, did her study. And then, uh, then, then, so this is the broader area of uh, what kind of study is going on. And another very important person we should uh, talk, um, and so we should discuss, that is uh, Professor Wariko. He worked on uh, Xinjiang, that was, uh, he started from uh, Mao period, the reform period, that is the, uh, some portion of your study also covers that. So 2013 to 2017. So this is the period. And he actually, he was, he was he's from Kashmir. And he uh, did some study on those uh, Uyghurs. And he came, first came to India. And I think one of the Erkin brothers studied in Kashmir University. Uh, 
uh, got his education in Kashmir, you know, from in Kashmir University. And Kashmir University is another place uh, where possibly there are many some archival materials uh, one can explore. And you mentioned that. So, uh, so what am I? I have only one question. Then I will open the floor for others uh, to intervene. So my only question is uh, from 2003, 2032 or entire period of Uyghur studies, means mm -hmm. uh, most uh, for me, what I find this period after the 1949 to culture, end of cultural revolution, this is the period most least studied period, I think, and least explored also. Yeah. So what is it? Because since uh, this is the period underground literature, means uh, that is one of your uh, dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a dissertation, MA dissertation, is it? So. Um, so I wrote my master's thesis on- Ma the Master gender. thesis. Yeah, yeah on gender thesis. incorporation. So of it was a master thesis. So yeah, you yeah. possibly have better idea about this uh, literature well, background, uh, this, that's, that pre period, cultural revolution period. And- yeah. uh, so what kind of, uh, so I think the, uh, when, for my understanding, this is the period which is uh, least studied and least explored. So I want your comment and uh, answer yeah. my question. And, okay, so. Yeah. so. Right. so I'll start with that. Um, yeah. So it's actually kind of a big question. So when I, when I started, graduate school, second time around, um, it was 2017, things are go were going downhill in Xinjiang. And when I lived in Xinjiang before I knew, I wanted to understand how things got to be the way they were in 2013, which is already very, very bad. Um, and I realized that everyone was giving me, you talk to Uyghurs, talk to Chinese people, talk to academics, everyone would give you a different answer. And I said, okay, you know, I should really look at the origins of this. I should go back to the 1950s to understand how these relationships were established. And at that point, there's a huge distrust of material produced in the PRC among China scholars. And I, um, people are starting, I think, to use it much more productively but there has not been much written on Xinjiang that qualifies as history post-1949. It's most, if you look at a lot of the scholarship, it's mostly ethnography and anthropology. Um, there's been a bit, there's a, I cannot remember, I think it was Zhangfe. There's a chapter in Maoism at the Grassroots that deals with Xinjiang in, the Cultural Revolution, which is actually quite good. It was written by a Chinese scholar. Um, and apart from that, there is not a lot of historical literature on Xinjiang or on Uyghurs in that period. Um, so I most I worked with what I have, which was mostly material either produced in an official capacity or produced by pop the popular press, which still meant that it went through censorship. And I used that kind of popular press read against like official handbooks and official, you know, the type of books that would be given to officials going to Xinjiang. Um, but I read like People's Daily articles or Women of China articles against those to find this kind of narrative fissure where, pe fissure where people are trying to map ideals onto the reality. Like journalists are mapping ideals onto the reality that they were encountering and you could kind of tease out from that what official policy was, what they were trying to do, what they were actually encountering, what they were reacting against. So you can work with that material. Um, I would suggest that more people do that, but there's not a huge wealth of complex material to work with. So. Great. Um, sorry, you're on mute. Uh, what about, uh, sorry, I was... Uh, mm -hmm. So um, what about uh, Hong Kong resources? resources from Hong Kong, any um, archival resource, uh, did you ever consult it? So Hong Kong, I think like 10 years ago, you could have done more yeah, research is, in Hong yeah. Kong. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that people, that Hong Kong is a great alternative to China right now in terms yeah. of political and academic freedom. Um, so we have, we have missed an opportunity. 
uh, means the uh, scholars uh, working on Xinjiang or uh, Uyghur, they missed an opportunity to explore archival material in Hong Kong. Is and it so? I don't, yeah, I don't know what would it be in yeah. Hong Kong. Um, I think a lot of, because a lot of the stuff is either in the British archives. So a lot of the material I was working with in India was actually from like British Indian government yeah. archives that didn't end up in queue. Um, so I don't think most of that would be in Hong Kong. There are a few incidents where people from Xinjiang were going through Hong Kong, but it was not a normal route for them. Okay, okay. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, so how many, how much material is there for in Indian National Archive, India, uh, mm -hmm. on the period, this period, the period I am talking about, this uh, from mm -hmm. 1949 to um, uh, year 80s, uh, how much material we have here? So, so that is the period actually. I I am very very much interested <laughs> that Mao era. Yeah, so, yeah. That's um, why I, so I think Madhavi said, could you talk about any difficulties? Actually, I talked about this with Madhavi as well. Um, talk about any difficulties you failed accessing materials in the National Archives of India, particularly as a foreign scholar. Um, I mean, so many of the things you request and they come back as like NT, like non-transferable, like non which just means like nobody cool. has any yeah. idea where they are. Um, I think I actually had better results than people, even, even I ended up with better results than some Indian origin scholars at doing their PhDs at schools in the US who are working on different topics. Um, one of them had like a 13% success rate in the material she was getting back. Mine was about 50 to 70%, um, but I was also, I kept, re-requesting things, I would not suggest anyone try to just go into the National Archives of India and get everything they needed within a week because you need to just keep requesting things and eventually it will show up. Um, I have no idea how much material is there, okay. but there's a lot, like there's more than I could go through okay. in the three months that I was in India with full rights. So... Uh, with this, I actually, when I was asked to chair the session, I was hesitating because I never worked on archival material. And uh, I think uh, uh, um, Madhvi ma'am must have many things to share with us. I, I, I would like to invite her to uh, say a few things and your comment, ma'am, and uh, any question. Um. Okay, uh, I think that actually uh, I was very glad I was able to meet Ariane before she left India. And um, I was very happy to learn that she, you know, actually was able to access a lot. Uh, so I think that says something about the, um, there is, has been some improvement in uh, the, uh, you know, getting access to files on China from India over the decades. Because, uh, you know, when I, I started in the 1980s, so at that time, uh, anything after 1914 was point blank uh, closed. So they didn't observe the, you know, 50 year rule or anything like that. If it was to do with China, you could access nothing after 1914, unless you got clearance uh, from uh, the, you know, the Ministry of External Affairs at a fair, fairly high level. So I think, uh, you know, uh, things have improved. Uh, I'm not very sure about this, but I think that uh, once it was, it has come under the Ministry of Culture or something, it has become a little less, um, uh, you know, a little easier to access than when it was completely under the home ministry, which was a different matter. So that was done at some point. And um, the other thing is, I think the Ministry of External Affairs itself declassified a lot of files. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, they have actually got a website where you can access uh, quite a few files without having to go to the 
National Archives itself. So I, I would really, you know, suggest that our scholars here, uh, you know, who can't get to the archives in Delhi for whatever reason, they should go to that website first and see what they can access. So anyway, this is this is uh, my experience a little bit uh, about uh, the archives, but only there's a problem. Did you face any problem, Ariane? Were they talking about, because they're talking of shifting the archives and, you know, uh, redesigning that whole area. And in fact, the, the building where the bulk of archives is, is going to be knocked down is from what I've heard. So, uh, did that come in your way at all when you were here in June, May, June, or whenever? Yeah, um, I have no idea because I don't know why I wasn't getting the files that I wasn't getting. Um, mm -hmm. So I will, I, I noticed people who were working on Northeast India were having much more difficulty getting files. Like if they were working on land ownership in Assam, that was a very sensitive topic. Mm. Um, so, and they thought that maybe that was because of the ship, the building shifts, but I, I was seeing a higher return rate on my like requisition slip. So I'm not sure if that just has to do with the building or if it's a combination of like building and topic. Um, I, I don't, okay. it seems like it's a little bit of a black hole. Um, mm -hmm. not, yeah, the other uh, one other thing I would say is a lot of material is actually accessible on the website. It doesn't appear to be at first. You have to log in, and then you zoom into what looks like just the first page. But then if you open it on your web browser, you can go through every single page, even in like a 253 page document. Um, mm. That was something I didn't know at first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I found at the archives, if you are friendly to the staff, yeah. you had small chat with them they were much more likely to help you find specific stuff or help you chase stuff down and mm -hmm. I think I noticed some people got a little bit frustrated with staff sometimes because they weren't getting what they needed and the staff were a little bit overwhelmed um, and I think the same is true in any archive that you're working with working in whether it's India or China that you should treat the staff nicely if you want mm -hmm. to get the material that you're looking for yes so, they can be very helpful sometimes, yes. Yeah, and I mean, they know where everything is to the extent that anyone can know where everything is. Thank you. So anybody else uh, want to intervene or comment or question? Anyone? Yeah, I would uh, like to, sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so my question is more of a present scenario. So uh, recently the OHSCHR, that is a United Nations Human Rights Officer, released a report regarding the present scenario of the Uyghurs. So many has like mentioned that this report is quite a toned down uh, effort and the report doesn't exactly say what the actual scenario is on the ground. So since Arian has been on the ground and has the access, so could you please give a light on that? What do you think of the report? Whether it shows the actual perspective or? So right after I was in India, I actually went to Munich where I worked with the World Uyghur Congress for a month. Um, and I interviewed a number of Uyghurs, both Uyghur activists and Uyghurs who had very recently uh, escaped the region. And I would say people have different experiences. Um, but it does seem like what is being reported on is actually happening on the ground. And I worked in education in China for a number of years. Um, so I actually ended up in Xinjiang because I'd been living in Yunnan before and teaching seventh grade at a public seventh at a public school, minority, like a minority majority school. And I became really interested in how the government taught minorities their Chinese identity through public education and through language education. And so the things that we're seeing in Xinjiang are really just an extension of that. They're an extension of this notion that everyone should work for the state, which is something that's very explicit in the 1950s and during collectivism and early communism or early socialism. Um, and that the government 
gets to determine what people's primary identities are, how they learn, and how they express those identities in daily life. So I think what we're seeing in Xinjiang is just a very extreme version of that. And a lot of people in China don't necessarily know what's going on in the camps, um, but they also think that it's okay because they've been told that it's okay, that these are extremists or that they are uneducated, um, that they are backward and that this is for their own good. They are being educated, they are being given careers. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, same facts, different perspectives. Uh, sorry, what on me? Anybody else uh, to ask question or Can I ask, uh, one more question? Okay, okay, sure, ma'am. Sure. It's not uh, on the archives per se, but uh, Ariane, in your experience among these Turkestani community in um, in Turkey now, is there memory of um, the their anybody's experience in India or uh, South Asia, this region? I mean, is there any preserved memory of that or uh, do pe are pe they themselves surprised? I mean, to know, you know, that it was- so, I think there's very little. Um, there was a Radio Free Asia article, internet article, and I can put that in the chat that came out a few years ago in which they interviewed people who had done this journey which is how I found out about the India part. Um, but kind of their journey through India is again, just two or three sentences. And that's consistent in Turkish scholarship on the Uyghurs in on Shinto. Well, mostly it's just on the Uyghurs. Um, it's the sense that people came through India with the final destination of Turkey in mind, with their Turkic heritage in mind. Um, so people know about it, but the importance of that for these earlier cross-border networks are kind of, um, they're not very prominent. So, and at the same time, most Uyghurs who are in Turkey today came in the 1980s when China had reform and opening. A lot of people came here uh, for economic or educational opportunities and then stayed on. And then of course, there's been a huge influx since 2013 or including people who couldn't go back to China who are already in Turkey. So. Me, uh, what I was telling about uh, uh, Professor Varku's uh, research on this, uh, that group who came to India first and for some time settled in Kashmir. The problem was that uh, Indian government was hesitant to recognize their even their presence so and uh, see um, Erkin Aleptekin uh, Isa Yusuf Aleptekin's uh, son he, he he stayed here that he, I was I forgot that time he he possibly he studied in Kashmir University okay so uh, do you have any idea about uh, these people you, because if it means uh, uh, Getting their, I um, in getting some kind of first hand information from them would have enriched your, uh, and so you will help you to um, for your study as well, because that is the period, crucial period when uh, this, uh, see, this is a time because uh, the time you are covering, it is actually uh, one after one nations got independence and that post-colonial kind of things as happening in various countries and there was some kind of celebration and in that process these smaller groups who were not in the core of the majority majority population uh, so they their 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 position was undermined in very various ways so uh, so I, uh, that's why I'm telling you that uh, say, talking to them directly possibly would have given or they are writing whatever means so their experience uh, they, uh, the kind of experience they gather during their stay in India and uh, that would have been possibly given you much more broader give, give you 
broader perspective about that period, especially that period from 1976, late 40s to early 50s. That is the period when possibly that is the period they stayed in India and then they gradually left. So, and in this context, I want to know more about your study on political belonging, because when we studied, we always, we always talked about identity, ethnic identity. And so by saying political belonging, are you saying the same thing or talking about the identity or you are talking about it is a much more, uh, it is little different from the identity, identity politics or I politics in and around identity. Hmm. I just, uh, please uh, go ahead with your. Um, so I'll try to answer your questions one by one, um, maybe going backwards. So I look at when I'm talking about political belonging, what I'm really looking at in my dissertation, which is not what I was looking at when I started my dissertation, is how people frame their request or demand for um, recognition, rights, and residence, and what domestic and international factors influence a state's willingness or ability to grant political belonging in the sense of recognition, rights, and residence. Um, so I'm not really looking at identity politics. The people that I look at, which is mostly um, Mehmet Amin Bora, who appears in the National, um, the Indian Archives as Mohammed Amin, um, or Mohammed Amin Bora later, and then Issa Yusuf Alptekin, who mostly appears as Issa Bey, or Issa Yusuf Olu. Um, they, these people changed their identity politics twice a decade. Um, they were really just trying to get this belonging and trying to establish a foothold. And I think you're right. Um, it is more difficult in a way, researching a people who did not win out in the race to form nation states. There is no nation of East Turkestan. So it's not like, uh, this is still very much a part of post-colonial and third world nationalism literature, but these people I'm not researching a state or the establishment of a state like um, Goodrich's world making after empire. Um, so, I mean, it is a little bit more difficult to establish exactly who these people are, what their community is, because the boundaries that they're drawing around the community are continuously shifting. Most of the people who go to Turkey in between 1952 and 1954 are actually Kazakh. And they're actually from Northern Xinjiang. So they did not initially identify with the East Turkestani at all. Um, it is a little bit difficult finding individuals to interview. Um, Erkin Alptekin came to Kashmir when he was 12. Um, somehow he got separated from his father when they were leaving Kashgar, ended up in, um, in Pakistan instead of India. I don't know how you leave a 12 year old kid on the other side of the border. Um, and then got a, you can find this in the archives, he got a specialized visa to come to India, to come to Srinagar, to reunite with his father in 19, in March of 1950, I think. Um, so he did spend some time in Srinagar, I think it was at like CS Boys School, Srinagar. I'm not sure if he went to university there. Um, but he's also getting quite old, so he doesn't do a lot of interviews anymore. And the other issue with studying India is that this narrative of East Turkestanis coming to India, of trying to settle down in India and gain refuge in India, doesn't support um, Uyghur nationalist initiatives in diaspora. Um, it very much goes against everything that people claimed once they end up in Turkey. So it's a little bit difficult to get people to talk about that time period, except in transition. Um, what's this say? Yeah, oh, there was um, a lot of the East Turkestani or Uyghurs did end up in Mecca or in Jeddah in communities around Mecca. There are about 50,000 Turkey from Southern Xinjiang and other parts of the Fergana Valley, which is 
mostly now Uzbekistan, live in that area today. And Ryan Thumb, um, I can put the name of an article that he wrote. He and a woman whose family was originally from Kashgar co-wrote an ethnographic article about those people who are in Saudi, the Turkeys who are in Saudi Arabia today. And there was, a, includes a memoir of a girl named Patsuma who emigrated when she was seven years old in about 1948, I think. Um, so there are still some people around. Um, they're getting a little bit old. Anybody, any question, please go ahead. Um, uh, Alkabem is there? Director is there? Yes. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm please. <laughs> <Why is it? laughs> uh, no. Well, this this is uh, this has been this has been very fascinating. I I just listening and following on from what we have been doing, uh, Madhavi's work, for instance, and uh, the fact that we we are trying our best to get our students interested in archival research. Um, so yeah, I mean. That's that's basically a bit of a challenge out here. People don't like to go too much into historical issues. Um, they prefer to stay on contemporary events. And um, so I, I, I had hoped that more students would join us on this occasion. But, uh, but I mean, I'm just uh, sort of quite uh, interested also in knowing whether there is awareness about uh, the holdings of the Indian archives uh, and the national archives. Is there awareness about this in, uh, you know, in, in, in and amongst uh, scholars, maybe in the West or, uh, because it's not just China related, it's, it's, you know, it's to do with a lot of things. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm not too sure about how many actually foreign scholars do come to the national archives. So I don't know whether you have any ideas or thoughts on that. Um, I would say while I was there, I saw a smattering of foreign scholars, maybe a dozen come through, but I think a lot of people use research assistance or they will come, like, come in for a few days and then I don't see them ever again. Um, so I'm not sure I, there are a lot of people who are in India working on India scholarship. Um, I don't think people necessarily turn to the Indian archives to look at China. This is not like the first place where people think to go, even though they might go to the British archives, which has less material written by the same people. Um, so there's definitely a wealth of material there that I feel like is really untapped in the West. And actually, mm -hmm. People yeah. in India have a great advantage over us because it's right there, and you have so right. much material that no, if you could, it would still be a one-sided history. But you could write an entire history of the region of Xinjiang or of Uyghur history in the 1800s or 1900s just using the Indian archives, which actually yeah. be really interesting to see somebody do. Um, yeah, I think the only other scholar I met in the archives who is also a Fulbright scholar and was not working on India with somebody who was working on Iraq and Basra in particular, because somehow all of those archives in the British Empire had now ended up at the National Archives of India. Um, but I haven't, yeah. I'd like to see more people. <laughs> exactly, I mean that, you see, the, why, why I was asking this is because uh, Madhavi would of course uh, be, uh, ideally place to comment on this and even Debashish who's been looking at some historical records. Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing is that we had a, a symposium which, is, which was on the Shimla conference and we had some contributors there who went to um, the archives in, uh, in Assam. Mm -hmm. uh, and one issue that come because we were discussing about their their problems and so on. So the first issue was that records were not very well maintained. There was a lack of uh, systematization, organization. They were access to them was not easy. And you stumbled upon things by chance. 
So it wasn't as mm -hmm. if you were aware of, okay, this is what I want and this is where it's going to be. Uh, two, there were also some restrictions on what you could see and what you couldn't see. Mm -hmm. uh, even though these are archival materials, which are like, you know, way past their sell-by date. So these were the two issues. And of course, the fact that uh, that whole sense of, of the importance of a historical record was not there among the people who were planning these places. I mean, the passion for documentation or like that. So it just uh, points to an overall uh, indifference, if you will, uh, to, uh, to the significance of the study of history. I don't know, Madhavi, uh, what I mean, maybe I'm just being a bit too pessimistic. No, I think um, you're right. And um, what I hope, you know, people hear what Aryan is saying is that in India here, we have an advantage for a change. <laughs> you know, for there's a lot of, uh, you know, times when you feel at a disadvantage here because, you know, getting to China, getting the funds, I remember mm -hmm. like first time I went out, that was to Hong Kong to get materials. You know, it was such a meager funding that uh, I, though I was a, you know, faculty of Delhi University, uh, the most I could afford was to, you know, share a room with a student in a, in a student dorm. And, you know, I had like about two weeks totally that before the money ran out. So, you know, but here the material is sitting there and um, you can really get into it. And, you know, now, of course, I was saying that it's nice that it's easier to access now than earlier, but there is a charm to accessing things when things were difficult also, because, um, you know, I remember uh, looking, looking for material on the Indian National Army and uh, people kept directing me to go upstairs, go downstairs, you know, uh, look here, there. And finally, a man, uh, you know, who a clerk who was sitting at a desk somewhere. And I said, you know, where is this box number? Where is this uh, file number something, something? And he said, he just pointed to a box which was lying on the floor. And he said, you want to take a look inside that? You can. And... You know, it was just a cardboard box on the floor and I opened oh. it and, you know, there were original photographs, there were letters, handwritten letters from people, I was holding them in my hand. There was no, there was no index of the material at all. I mean, if I had been a little unethical, I could have just put the stuff in my bag and walked out because there was no checking either. Um, there were diaries lying there. Uh, anyway, the good thing is that they have now you know, indexed it and they have scanned everything and you know, anybody can see it, but you cannot hold those things in your hands uh, anymore. <laughs> and uh, that is a, you know, that's a particular charm uh, of doing that kind of archival research. But I think you know, apart from the National Archives, there will be all these uh, regional archives, you know, like when I was looking for the you know, Kazakhs from Xinjiang who were in Bhopal. I mean, the Madhya Pradesh State Archives is there and there is material there, but it's hard to access. You don't get any replies if you try emailing them. So you have to go there and, uh, you know, knock on their door and you probably will find things. And um, I think, uh, I don't know, Ariane, did you? You know, would you feel tempted to come back and, you know, if you were able to access things in Srinagar or Jammu, I don't know, wherever they, the uh -huh. archives are there, would you be, do you think you would find material there on? So one thing I was actually really interested in finding that I didn't find um, was Sheikh Abdullah's personal papers because there's so much contention and really different opinions about the conversations he had with East Turkestani leaders, the promises he did or did not make them and how he relayed those to the government. And I got, I think they might be um, Etienne Murthy, but I'm not really 
sure. And I had enough other material since just like one chapter in my dissertation that is really focused on this, um, that I didn't need to go there as well. I also didn't finish finding all of the archival material that I thought was at the National Archives in India. So that's why I didn't move to another archive. Um, I am not sure what is up in Jammu and Kashmir because I was on the Fulbright while I was in India. We were actually forbidden from going up to Kashmir, so I didn't attempt that. Um, I think there's a lot of material up there for anthropologists and ethnographers because there is a decent amount of material culture left up there. But I don't know, there could be. Question any from anybody? There are some interns present here. Anybody? So uh it is all, only only one hour so we have covered so usually when is the seminar is uh, one and a half an hour um discussion so but uh, i uh, i have one question ma'am uh i want to ask uh thampi ma'am that uh, is I mean, say, in, is there anything in Punjab? I am curious about that because no, uh, no let me let me finish uh, because I mean, especially uh, Indian diaspora related thing because uh, you work on uh, this area and uh, see from your uh, some of your study you found some. Uh, Sikh uh, who work in China, in China so were not work as when they are from Punjab and there were also a large number of Sikh uh, uh, sentries um, uh, in China, deputed in China in the colonial period. So do you have any archival material regarding them? Yeah, it seemed like there were a lot of Punjabi traders in Yarkand, which is a specific, fairly small town um, in Altishar or in southern Xinjiang. And a lot of them were actually involved in the Taras trade, which is Taras. I had to look this up as well. It's like a form of like highly potent raw dried marijuana. Um, so there was a huge, you'd have these people who were claiming that they were farmers, but they were like today's value, they would have been millionaires. They owned hundreds and hundreds of acres and they were trading um, you know, felts and cloth and other things over the border. But they, it was there was a huge drug trade going from Yarkand to Srinagar, Srinagar and then Amritsar, um, Hoshai, yeah, it was Hosh. There was one small town in Punjab that yeah, most of the yeah. traders were from there. Um, and I looked it up and it's, I mean, Boshiar. not a large city. Um, there is a predominance of traders from Shapur in Xinjiang. Um, there were also a number of accounts of most of these people got kicked out in 1939 when the Soviets came in and then Shang kicked out the Soviets and all the other foreigners and their farmland, farm land, like their drug farms were con confiscated. Um, by the state, and there are a number of archival number of archives on this thing called the Tungan Gold, which I think Madhavi and I talked about, um, in which these people claimed compensation from the Indian government, um, and the Indian government gave some payouts from gold that had been confiscated from kind of renegade. Um, Chinese Muslim warlords who tried to escape through India in 1937. So that's, it's very tangled. There's a lot of very tangled history in there. There are a lot of documents on the Punjabi traders in Xinjiang. I don't know if that answers your question. So. Um, we have a question in the chat box, uh, which says, how is political situation at Xinjiang in the current context now? Well, if you have any insight on that. Um, I think there are a number of very 
good articles in the Made in China journal, um, over here, which is a oops, journal, um, which is a free online journal that um, has a lot of academics contribute to that. So I know like Ryan Thumb, David Brophy, and a um, number of other people have written, and I think Judd Kinsley have written articles on, they're all historians, they've written articles on the contemporary issues in Xinjiang as well. Um, I, I would say, so when I left in 2013, Xinjiang was definitely on its way to becoming a police state. Like I worked at a university. I was one of three foreign teachers. I, when you exited the university, all minority students had to show their IDs, go through like airport security, and write down where they, their name, their ID number, where they were going, what they were going to do there, who they were going to meet, and what time they were going to be back. And that was nine years ago. That was before they instituted the camps. And so there was already a very, there were already CCT cameras at every corner. There were already like SWAT teams on across the street from every mosque. Um, you could not go anywhere without people knowing where you were going. You couldn't send text messages with certain words in them. And this was nine years ago. And China's security, I have not lived in Xi Jinping since China. Um, China's security system has only gotten more intense since then. Um, political situation is very much in control and is not, I don't think they are easing up on that control at all. So, So, Karnal Sahai, this is uh, actually political uh, situation in Xinjiang. Actually, though we are not talking on that case specifically, we're not talk, discussing this issue. And I know, I know this is the, actually this is the area we have always. We always have some interest. So, but uh, political situation, day-to-day -day political situation is really. Uh, in a very, uh, I think, uh, very difficult to say how Uyghurs are surviving these days. And uh, possibly, means the last few days, um, few years, uh, what was happening under Chan Chuan Guo, that uh, uh, now I think they have managed the way they wanted to manage and uh, um, uh, put the Uyghurs, segregation is uh, almost uh, done. So, so Chan Chuan Gaur finishes task there and some new guy is appointed and that's all. So, con so now stability is the <laughs> uh, main thing. They have already stabilized, it appears to me. And uh, internationally, time to time, there are reactions, but uh, international reaction is not really not adequate. And uh, but let's uh, uh, most importantly, let's talk about this archival things and historical period. So, uh, if there is any question regarding that, please uh, ask some question to Arian. And uh, anybody. I have one thing to add to the political situation, which is that um, just like I wrote my master's thesis, mostly using items from the popular and official press kind of read against each other, teasing out what the state was reacting against. If you want to understand the political situation in Xinjiang, you can always go to the official kind of like government propaganda videos. There are a lot of them released by CCT, CC, the TV and they, are, they have English subtitles. Um, they are pure propaganda. But if you are watching these videos, whether it's on new farming techniques, um, economic development, or countering terrorism in Xinjiang, all you need to keep in mind is, what are they reacting against? What are they writing this narrative against? What are they trying to convince me and why? What are they trying to, what knowledge are they trying to counter or undermine? And I think if you do that, you'll get a pretty good idea of what the political situation is in Xinjiang. You just have to reverse watch the videos, if that makes sense. So. Uh, of course, uh, 
this uh, whatever coming out from China, we need to question. And uh, as far as Xinjiang, Tibet, and many other issues, but uh, but actually one term uh, used uh, long back, uh, Frederick MacFarger used the Tibetanization of China. So possibly Uyghurization of China all over China is happening under Xi Jinping. The way people are monitored. Uh, every every corner of China. So it is uh, now it is very difficult. Uh, not only Xin, Xinjiang people are under seas. Uh, everybody under the camera, everybody under means uh, government is uh, watching everybody. So that kind of situation. So even some scholars uh, talk about that uh, 19, uh, that, no that novel, uh that 19 1989 80, 84 and uh, so talking about that uh, complete complete uh surveillance so that kind of situation is happening in china so, so all over china so it is uh, when, uh, of course as far as minorities is concerned it is of uh, much more severe so and other kind of repressions are also there. So, uh, so anyway, uh, Arian, what is your, uh, what are the difficulties you faced as a, as a foreign China scholar in India, as a scholar in archive or various other places, and in general life? Because as a Fulbright scholar. You can share that will possibly help uh, many people to know, uh, even in your country, that uh, um, what kind of situation one can face mm, exploring uh, material here and exploring mm, other, not only as a China scholar, general scholar, any scholar uh, who are interested here in India doing research, so. I think um, for me, when I came at the Fulbright, they required everyone to come within the same time window, which happened to be when it was 47 degrees in Delhi. Um, so that was difficult. I would recommend not, not going in April or May um, or June to Delhi. Um, I mean, I think you just need to plan ahead. Um, procedurally, things work a little bit different and it's good to have everything in order. And there was a lot of, every week I would show up to the archives to get my daily pass and there would be somebody there trying to figure out like why they couldn't just get into the archives um, and somebody else on the phone explaining that they had to go through the entire procedure and prove who they were and provide a letter from their university. Um, so just say, probably the most important thing is do your research before you show up and make sure you have everything in hand so you don't, you're not just waiting around a week in order to get access. Um, be nice to the archivist. Like, write, email them before you show up. Um, a lot of material I've gotten in the US has actually just been from knowing people and networking with people. Um, sharing material with them. If you share material with people, they're more likely to share material material with you or point you in the right direction. So I think generally other people are your best resources. And yeah, most difficult things, sometimes nobody has any, nobody has looked at something before. And in Turkey, almost nobody working on the Uyghurs in Turkey uses archival material. So nobody has any idea where any of it is. Um, so that's, it's been very difficult tracing, like tracking some stuff down. I assume I would have had some of the same difficulties if I tried to use the Punjab archives. Um, like my hobby, I tried to look them up and there's no index online and I have no, I don't know anyone who's used them. Um, it wasn't central to my dissertation, so I didn't pursue it. Um, yeah, I think mainly those things. So do your research before you go, email everybody, have something to share. Um, know that if you share, people will share with you.
Don't show up in empty handed. So, so don't show up when it's 47 degrees outside. Um, so uh, let's, uh, should we, should we conclude, ma'am? Oh, uh, sure. Anyway. Sir, we, uh, yeah. So, should, should I take a also? Okay. Okay. So, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, Arian, for this, uh, for your talk and giving us, enlightening us about uh, what kind of, and especially emphasizing that this, this, this resources in National Archives should be explored and, uh, and possibly in regional archives also. This is high time to do some research on this area. So with this note, thank you very much for your talk. And with, uh, I extend your uh, Thank you for having me here. All best wishes for your research. Yes. And, yeah. and um, hope you come again soon. And uh, thank you all, everybody, the, the true, lovers of history who have turned up here. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Madhavi. Thank you all. Okay. 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 Um, thank you very, every, uh, very much, everybody. Uh, with this, we will wrap up the session and we thank all the panelists and the audience for joining us and giving us a precious time. The recording of the session will be available on ICS YouTube channel. On behalf of ICS, I would like to welcome everyone for the next seminar, which will be happening on next Wednesday titled Joint Operations Capabilities of Western Theatre Command of the uh, People's Liberation Army or the PLA. The information related to the same will be available on ICS website or you could also subscribe to our newsletter for regular updates. Thank you and have a nice day.